This is Justin. And this is Haley. You're listening to The Price of Avocado Toast. We're a married millennial couple wanting to normalize the conversations around money. We want to hear about your highs and your lows. The do's and the don'ts on your path towards financial freedom. Toasties, welcome to The Price of Avocado Toast. Whether you're a first-time listener or you've been following us from the start of this thing, we're so glad to have this conversation with you today. It has been a week. (laughs) Yes, it has. It has been a busy, busy week. We put our house on the market last week. It's now day eight on the market. We have seven offers that we are about to review this morning in about an hour. And so we are not recording a full-blown episode this week. This was pre-recorded from a few weeks ago. But make sure you tune in next week. We will have a whole episode really just explaining the process of the sale of our home from when we listed it to accepting an offer, which hopefully happens today. Yeah, we want to give you guys an insight into the exact process. We've been transparent about everything, so there's no reason for us to not be transparent about exactly how the home process went down. Obviously, with some discretion, if it's like a legal thing that we can't speak on. But If we can share information, we're going to share it with you guys because we want to be as upfront as possible so you can learn maybe a trick for you next time you sell or buy a home. And uh, yeah, that's our goal. So make sure you tune in next week. But for today, we're going to be dropping our interview with Millennial Financial Educator. This is Candice, the No Shame Money Coach. We had an awesome chat with her a couple weeks ago, and we've been backlogging this one. But we're so excited to share it with you. She is such a energetic and an awesome person. I can't wait for them to hear this interview. So I'll shut my mouth so we can get right on into our interview with Candice, the millennial financial educator. All right, you guys, today we are sitting down with Candice. She runs the millennial financial educator Instagram account. Candice, thanks for uh, taking some time out of your Sunday to chat with us. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for having me. I feel like I've just been picked from like handpicked to be on TV or something. I feel like, I feel amazing. Thank you guys for having me on your podcast. (laughs) Yeah, we're stoked to get to talk to you. I know that um, Haley's been really excited and kind of been looking forward to having you on. So uh, yeah, we're we're appreciative of you giving us some some of your time on this Sunday. So thanks. Can you tell our listeners just a little bit about like who you are, what you do as a financial coach and, and just a little bit about your background really? Yes. So I consider myself, I call myself the no shame money coach. And I do teach millennia women of color how to do more than simply pay bills and die. And I teach them how to build wealth without following trends. It's my, my little phrase that I like to say. Um, My background. So I don't have a background in finance. Actually, I got into finance coaching because my own finances were like a hot mess. And as I was going through the process of, I had a money mentor and I was fixing things and I was just sharing things on Instagram just kind of as I was learning. And people started asking me if I was coaching and would you coach me? Would you help me? That kind of thing. And then it it started with me just kind of helping people behind the scenes. It wasn't a business or anything like that, but then the demand just started to grow. And so I was like, okay, you know, and people were, people wanted to pay me to help them. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, like I'll just try it. Let's just see how it goes. And And that's how I got into financial coaching. And I absolutely love doing what I do. I love, I guess, like, you know, being a teacher, when you see like your your student, I'm doing air quotes, um, when they get it and like that light bulb goes off and you're like, oh my God, I influence influence change. So (laughs) I really, I really love doing that, you know, for the culture and, and, and encouraging my clients as they learn from me to take it and teach it to their children, teach it to their spouses and things like that to continue to spread that message across to, to, to everyone who needs the message. I love that. So are you a teacher like by day? Is that your day job? Are you a teacher? Ooh, no, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I could, I used to work with children. I love children, but I don't think I could be a teacher. Um, in my day, my day job is pretty boring. I'm a government employee. So, you know, it, it's just a lot of bureaucracy and just computer boring stuff it's nothing is nowhere near as exciting as my financial coaching (laughs) business that's for sure (laughs) it's cool though it seems like you kind of have the heart of a teacher like people you know are enjoying it and stuff and that's got to make you feel good that like people saw what you were doing and were like hey not only like do i want you to coach me but even when i'm in financial struggles i'm willing to pay you money to coach me and i think that that's kind of a difficult balance for financial coaches because you're always Mm -hmm. having to sell people on like hey like i know you're short on cash but 
if you, you know, pay for this service, I'll help you get you to where you need to be. And I know that that's it. I mean, it's just a really difficult topic to approach with clients, but it's cool that people mm -hmm. reached out. I mean, that's got to make you feel, feel good that your services were wanted. Yeah, I was, I was surprised. I don't know if that's good or bad, <laughs> but I was just really, <laughs> I was honestly very surprised um, that people were reaching out to me and I wasn't really selling anything initially. Um, but it's, it's kind of, it is like that, you know, you, you struggle with money. And so spending money on a coach may seem kind of counterintuitive, but then I've had, like when I first kind of started and, you know, working with people for free, then it's like, you know, though, when you have some skin in the game, like the same thing with investing or, or lots of other things, when you have some skin in the game, you really take it serious because I do, um, my clients have to do homework or for people who don't like the word homework, action items, deliverables, things like that. Um, and I hold them accountable to a certain degree. And um, when you have, again, some skin in the game, people tend to show up a lot more because I'm also, I'm absolutely going to show up hundred percent as the coach. Um, and I think co a, a financial coach is still new, right? So sometimes I've had clients who are like, you know, people in their lives are like, why do you have a money coach? What do you need, need to do that for? Just create a budget or just put the money aside or just do this. So it's not something that's widely accepted, maybe as, you know, paying a personal, uh, um, a personal trainer or paying uh, someone to do your resume. It, it's still kind of new. So I understand how, you know, it, it'll take a little time maybe as a whole for people to get used to that uh, type of transaction in the industry. That makes a lot of sense because I was thinking of like personal trainers when, you know, clients pay them and they're like, okay, well, even if I don't want to go to the gym, like I've got money on this, I need to go work with my personal trainer. Right. right? And that makes it a little bit more, you know, invest, I guess, investing, what a good word, but like you're more invested yeah. in working with your financial coach because you're paying for that service. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to bust tail mm -hmm. because like you said, I've got some skin in the game. Like this isn't just me like getting free services or something that I can abuse. Yeah, mm -hmm. I agree. I think like we have workout equipment in our garage that we bought. Mm -hmm. So now it's just sitting there, right? So technically we're not paying <laughs> for it right now. But like if we paid someone to come here and train us, we sure as hell would be using that equipment, you know? Like you uh -huh. have to really when your money is invested in something you definitely do for the most part put more effort into it. Yeah. That's a really yeah. good point. Mm -hmm. I love like that, that analogy. I agree. Yeah. So if you're comfortable, tell us about what your what your childhood was, was was like growing up or like what your relationship with money was as you got into a spot where maybe you struggled with money and then became a financial coach what was your background and relationship with money that led you down this road listen it was the hot mess express okay like i <laughs> my family like we didn't talk about and i grew up in a multi-generational household so um, there was plenty of opportunity, should have been plenty of opportunity for everybody to save, invest. Like I wasn't paying any rent. My mom, I don't believe she, we were living with her parents, right? You know, I mean, in both of my parents, you know, they're both in my lives, but my, my parents just were, they never got married. So I stayed with my mom and my grandparents. And it's just like, you know, we were shopping every weekend. You know, we were going to get cars. We were buying computers and doing all these things. And nobody... And like, it was always said to me, um, like, uh, you should have plenty of money. You know, you live at home and you don't have to pay for anything. And it's just like, but I don't. But when I get paid, my account's still red. I'm always in a negative when payday hits, you know, because I didn't have any type of foundational basics. And so um, when I moved out and got my first apartment, I had roommates, but it was just like, dang, like I'm an adult now. Nobody told me I, like, I got to pay for cable and I got to pay my share of the rent and then it's like groceries and people eating my groceries. And it's like, yep. <laughs> you know, this, <laughs> so now I got to buy more groceries. And so it's just being in that real world because living in under two generations, it's different. I believe when you just have your parents versus when you have your grandparents, there's a, uh, like just a bit more well-rounded things that go on in the household. And so I was just in this bubble of like, no matter what I do, I can mess up really, really bad. And there's this covering that I have over me regardless. And now that I'm out on my own, I'm calling grandma and I'm crying like, grandma, I don't know what to do. And she's like, this is what you wanted, baby. You wanted to, you wanted to move out and do your own thing, you know? And so, um, it just turned into me just making bad decision after bad decision. Um, and then I finally, I did not get my finances together until 
maybe three years ago, three or four years ago. And for me, my turning point, so it wasn't anything super crazy. I got denied for a mortgage and my credit score was in the 700s. I had a good, you know, good stable employment history. And I felt like there's no reason for you to deny me a mortgage, right? Because I have yeah. the credit score and I have stable history. And when I was denied, that's what really gave me like that wake up call because I'm like, now if I want to get a house, I can't renew this lease because then I won't be able to stay for the house, right? So that for me was the wake up, wake up call that I needed to actually reach out to find a money mentor and like, look, tell me what I'm doing wrong. I have, I'm going to be transparent because at that point I had never, we never talked, I told you, we never talked about money in my family. Um, in the relationship that I had, I never talked about how much money I made, you know, it just wasn't a thing. So when I hit that point where I'm not, I just hit that stone wall. That's when I said, okay, now I'm going to be hundred percent transparent. It's very ugly what I've been doing in the state that I'm in, but I'm so desperate to fix it that like, I'll tell you whatever you want to know. Um, so that's how I, I went from, you know, just being terrible with my finances and really not having a desire to fix them because I didn't, I wasn't really aiming for anything. You know, I was just enjoying my life. I was in my early 20s and I was having fun. You know, I wasn't thinking about, you know, you know, children and marriage and things like that at that time. And then once I started having goals and things and a major goal that I had was knocked down right in front of me, then I said, okay, hold up. <laughs> like something has to change. Wow. That'll yeah. definitely light a fire. Yeah, definitely. Did you ever figure out what exactly it was that denied you? Was it like the debt to income ratio? It was... Um, one of my credit cards was like maxed. <laughs> like what, like the credit card was, I had gotten to the max and the close to the max and the bank increased my limit because, and I was like really shocked at that because, you know, but I was just like, wow, they're like, okay, well you can get an even more debt with us. It's fine. They automatically increased my limit. So the, the credit card was about maxed out. I had no savings at all. Um, there was something in collection at the time that I took care of. Um, but it was, it was those things, you know, I was like, I had, who did I think I was? I was going to buy a house with no money in the savings account at all. <laughs> like, I mean, I had, a, I had a 401k, but like, I didn't want to cash out my, um, my investment to buy a house. And so at that time, of course, there are other mortgage brokers who are like, oh no, no, no. If you apply with us, I can get you, we can get you a, into a mortgage tomorrow. And I was just like, you know, if because I applied through my credit union initially and I said, if my credit union who I've been banking with for years at this point, if they don't think I'm good enough and they know all of my history, honestly, then I'm not going to go to some outside broker and possibly put myself in a worse situation. So I at least had enough sense to check myself in that moment. I think that that's, it's wise of you to do because credit unions, at least in our, you know, experience are looking out for their clients a little bit more sometimes than those big banks. Oh yeah. Um, Way more. Yeah. We were, we were banking with a big bank, had a, an overdraw or no, it was like a fraud, excuse me. And it was like two grand and we, it didn't get returned to our bank for like four weeks. And then, oh. so we switched to our local credit union and a couple months later there was like a, a $50 charge that mm -hmm. they canceled our cards, called me 10 minutes after it happened, refunded the money. Like they were on it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I guess $50 is a little bit easier than two grand, but it seems like the local credit units definitely have, you know, a little bit more of a moral backbone than some. So if you're right, like if you've been banking with them for years and they're not going to do it, like it's time to be like, okay, I got to look in the mirror and see what's going on. And I don't know mm -hmm. if we had any, like, we didn't have anything like that, but there was definitely, we kind of went through that same thing where like you're, you're putting stuff on credit card, you don't have savings and you're like, okay, like <laughs> I'm, you know, I should, this is not how it should be for us. Well, for me, and I know for so many people, the credit card was our savings. Like mm -hmm. the credit mm -hmm. card was our emergency fund. The credit card was everything. You know, anytime we ran out of money or needed anything extra, we had that cushion and mm -hmm. that turned into really quickly having 10 credit cards and then $27,000 worth of credit card debt. And it was mm -hmm. real quick, quick spiral. And I think if you're not like for you wanting to get a mortgage, if that's your goal, if you don't know all the things that you need to do to get the mortgage, people are like, Oh, well, this is pretty easy. You know, now I have a career. I can just 
put a down payment on on the home and be done. But it, there's so many more steps to being approved. And the debt to income ratio thing kind of tripped me up a bit because I didn't really understand how my student loans had anything to do with buying a home, you know, but mm -hmm. it does like they have to balance it all out. And we were advised a few times to just like cool it, cool <laughs> it on the financing. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to ask you, have you ever had any experiences with clients where someone, maybe they reach out and they want to work with you, but mm -hmm. then you, as you're working with them, you've kind of realized that they haven't really made the mindset shift or changed the habits and they're just like really, really not ready. And then you had to like step away as a coach. Have you ever had that happen? I have not had that happen yet. Thankfully. Um, I have had situations where, uh, because you know, people go through things in life, right? So if someone is not showing up as a coach, because we are, you know, they're, contracts involved you know so as a coach I I'm being your coach right so I'm gonna we're definitely gonna address it directly I'm gonna you know try to get a feel for kind of what's going on because all of my clients I don't I mean I care more about your money right you know one of my clients got married okay I send her a card you know I you know, I care about you as a person and like what's going on with your in your life so I want to know what's going on and kind of I step into like that that authority role and just try to get them to, to see how maybe they can balance things a little bit better. Now, if someone, if I had someone in my program who life crisis or something like that, you know, and they just could not focus because everyone's different. One of my coach, uh, one of my clients while I was working with her, her dad um, passed away, but she did not want to back out of coaching. So, you know, it, it is different for different people, but I haven't had a situation where someone wanted to back out after we were working together. Um, sometimes it does take longer for certain people with that mindset shift um, or to even get to that point where they're like, I want to push through with this. Or even if all this chaos is going on around me, being in this program is like one of the things that I maybe have absolute control over. So let me just focus on that to kind of keep me grounded. That's happened before. Um, but no, I haven't had anyone try to kind of run away from me yet. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that it's partially because your attitude like and your positivity that you bring into coaching along with like being willing to hold people accountable and like being willing to hold their feet to the flames of like, yo, you said you wanted to do this. Like, let's do this. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of my clients do say that because, of course, I, I love to get feedback from them. And a lot of people do say like, you know, when I came to the meeting, it felt like I was talking to my friends or, I, you know, Candace's positivity because some people come to me literally and say, I hate talking about money. And I'm like, well, I don't know what you want me to do because that's what we have to talk about like all the time, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. That's what I'm here for. So, but these same people don't feel that way by the time we're done working together. And they do a lot of times because, you know, of course I, I like to get the feedback when they're done. Attribute that to the energy that I bring to them, you know, and not feeling like, you know, I'm not talking over their heads in terms that they don't understand. Um, they know they can come to me with whatever questions and I'm not going to make them feel stupid because you could have Googled it or something. Because sometimes when you Google something, you know, then you got to Google again to figure out what the heck that article said because those <laughs> that concept doesn't make sense the way they explained it. And then this part maybe doesn't apply to you. So now you're internalizing things that you don't need to internalize. And it's all, you know, it's just a whole complex web of things in the finance world. You guys know that. But so, yes, I do believe my personality has a lot to do with it. Um, and I try not to make it boring where it just feels like another, uh, just another thing that I have to check off my list. I feel like when people, I don't know, this is just totally my opinion, but I feel like if someone were to reach out to a financial coach, you're already at a point where you're like, willing to face what you've done with your financials and I feel like you'd be at a point where you'd be accepting to someone giving you some financial advice mm -hmm. for the most part mm -hmm. you know like I don't know if I were in a spot where I were reluctant I definitely wouldn't be reaching out to someone about that for sure but I think a lot of people also maybe don't understand like what it takes or the transparency that it takes like they and, yeah. and I, I think some other people want like others maybe to do the work for them versus like being coached along and being like, all right, now it's the hard work because you got to do it. Like I can show that's you a, everything and like teach point. you it, but I thought of that. you've got to do it yourself. You know what I mean? I mean, we've had an experience yeah. where somebody that we, we were kind of walking alongside just wasn't quite ready for it. And they, they had to kind of tap out because it just wasn't fitting into their life. And I mean, that's no, no guilt or, you know, 
no fault on them, but sometimes it just doesn't line up with what they're doing in the moment. Very true. And the timing yeah. for, for those sure. people definitely wasn't wasn't aligned. For sure. So, Candace, you've said that you are a no-shame money coach. I love that. Yeah. Can you just tell us what that means to you, like being a no-shame <laughs> money coach? I feel like there's so much shame in this community. <laughs> well, yes. there can be. Not all of the people. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, it's, it's pretty much like kind of just what I was saying about um, people feeling safe to ask the questions they want to ask. Um, the transparency and knowing that no matter what you tell me, I'm not going to, you know, jump down your throat. Even people who aren't my clients, I've had people in my DMs, um, like maybe they'll respond to a poll or something that I posted in my stories. And then I respond to them in the DM and they're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe you reached out to me, you know, because it, and it, and it circles back to, I didn't want to reach out to you first because I follow other money pages and they're just really condescending or they, you know, they really shame people in the comments and stuff. And I, I was like, oh my God, like I never, ever want, I mean, now if I say something polarizing, which I've done before, um, and people disagree, um, like, you know, I, I've talked about like after pay and the firm and, you know, how those things, why those things aren't good ideas. And I mean, for, for things like, for buying things like beauty products and things that aren't really necessities, um, you know, people were upset that I said these things and they were kind of lashing out in the comments. And so there's always going to be someone who doesn't agree. You know, I don't argue with strangers on the internet, right? right? But I never shame anyone for anything they decide to do. So that just, and it's, it's not just my money coaching, it's who I am as a person. So it's easy to carry that over into my business. Um, as far as, you know, live and let live, not, you know, making people feel small because they see something a little bit different than I see it. Um, so I carry all that, that same kind of mentality over into my coaching and just letting people know, you know, you don't have to be ashamed that you have $200,000 of student loan debt, or you don't have to be ashamed that you don't have student loan debt and that you can't relate to the same struggle that everyone else has. And it makes you feel you come from a place of entitlement or people look at you funny because you can't relate to them to a certain degree. So no matter what your situation is, there's no shame from my end. That's so important because so many people do feel that like, well, I have this amount of debt, but at least it's not student loan debt. So I guess I'm better off than them or something. I, I can't remember the word for that, but it's like, oh man, it's going to pop into my brain, of course, at like 2 a.m. But it's when people, <laughs> you know, recognize like that, that you're still allowed to feel like, damn, I'm in a bad money situation or I'm not doing the right stuff. Even if I don't mm-hmm. have, you know, $200,000 of student loans, or if I only have student loans and I didn't get into credit cards, like, you know, you don't ever have to like compare and yeah, feel shame based off of your own situation. You can kind of own your own situation and, and try and work through it. Totally. I feel like mm-hmm. if you have a, like a $20,000 car loan or something, You can still have the same feeling as someone who has $175,000 worth of student loan debt. It's like that, the pressure and the fear uh, and the anxiety over being able to pay the bill or pay off the debt, it's still there, no matter how much or how little debt you have. So that's a good point as well. Yeah. How many hours a week does coaching take up in your time, like on top of your other everyday life? So it depends on how many clients I have. So at one point I had like six clients at once. And I was like, oh, this is too, this is too many clients at one time. <laughs> so my, my spaces in my one-on-one program are limited. So I say out of a week, you know, like, let's just say I have, let's just say I have three clients. I don't know. I like, I've never even thought about quantifying it. That's something I need to do. <laughs> right. Because I have my time to talk to them. It, it takes up more time probably than I, than I want to say, because I offer, um, outside of my like zoom calls, I do things like this with them. Right. And then of course I have to do my research and all of my plans for them are customized. So it's not like a cookie cutter. Each person gets the same topic on each call. Right. Um, so there's research for what each person needs and also um, Voxer. So if anyone you know listening isn't familiar with Voxer, it's like a text messaging and walkie talkie app. So there's unlimited access to me on that as well. So whereas a lot of my social media runs on automation, I'm always like responding to my clients in real time through text, right? So if they're asking me something, I'm like, oh, I need to, you know, get to this, answer this question or, you know, get some more um, information to give this person about that. 
So all of those things filter into the time. So it's it's some hours, but it just I don't know. I guess because I I mean I like money. I could talk about money all day. You know, it doesn't bother me because I know exactly how many clients I can take on so that I don't feel overwhelmed and I'm always showing up with the willingness to help in the right spirit. Um, and I think another thing that helps me is that my nine to five, I hope nobody at my job is listening to this, but my nine <laughs> to five right now is really quiet, right? So I don't feel, I telework because of COVID and I hope it continues after COVID, but the job is really quiet, you know? So I do, um, you know, I don't feel stressed on my job. It's not extremely demanding or anything like that. So, you know, where you have a nine to five and you have to shut that off and then show up and try to reprogram yourself. I don't have such a, a, a rough transition between the two. That's awesome. That makes it really convenient. And it seems like you've done a really good job of, yeah, identifying what you can give to your clients. Mm -hmm. But then once mm -hmm. you've identified what you can give, it seems like you really do give a lot. Like when you've yeah. decided that this is what you're going to give. Because I think if, you, if you're not like quantifying it, like, oh, this time, this time. But if you're like, hey, if I'm working with you, like I'm accessible and right, I want to help right. you get there. Like, that's cool that you're that dedicated to them. That's really awesome. Do you think I'll ever make this into a full-time thing? Because I feel like the demand <laughs> is totally there. Yeah, you're right, though. It's a new thing. Like, not many people know about financial coaches. So as you build your brand and your business, like, it very well could turn into a full-time thing. It could. You want it to. I, that's not something that I've actually planned for, right? So, I mean, I think it would be cute, like, if I – because I, I love doing the one-on-one -on -one thing, right? So – um, I do realize there are so many people who want to work with me that can't afford the one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm working on developing some other things to be accessible to more people. Um, you know, maybe like if I added some other things to my business model, but it's just not, I don't know, because I just started doing this like, um, last summer. Right. So it's still like incredibly new and I'm still, you know, figuring out how I want to branch out and exactly, I mean, you know, I have like my little, I want to be, you know, I want to, cause I'm also, I love to write. So I have like my little vision board things like, oh, I want to write a finance article for this person or for that magazine or whatever. But as far as full-time coaching, I hadn't even thought like, I, no, that's not a goal. Dang, now you're going to give me stuff to think about. <laughs> yeah, Think I about like it. it. I like it. So, Candice, I've got a question that I'm going to try my best to phrase it in a way that's appropriate and getting, getting, I guess, my idea across of what I'm thinking. But there are not a lot of women of color in the financial space, right? And it's, yeah. it's predominantly white dudes, old white dudes who are wealthy through whatever tool they've used and kind of just spew that same kind of like pull yourself up by your bootstraps idea that um, – mm -hmm. While it can work for some, it tends to not approach some of these systemic issues that are surrounding money and marginalized communities. So mm -hmm. if, if you're comfortable with me asking, as a woman of color, do you take a certain amount of like pride or um, – yeah, I guess pride is the word of like helping build the, the community of other women of color so that they have the appropriate slice of the pie that – that should have been there all along, but obviously we know in America is not the case. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, I've seen a lot of the influencers on Instagram this weekend posting that I guess the White House has contacted them. Um, the, the larger platforms with like hundreds and thousands of followers, um, they're, they're supposed to talk to somebody at the White House. They're doing this thing where they want to hear from um, communities of, of color, marginalized people and things. So that that's great, right? For me... Um, I'm not at that level, right? And I understand that even if we have these conversations, because they already know, they know about the disparities, they know where they stem from. If they wanted to fix them at this point, they would have fixed it. This is how I, the way I look at it. So I like to take the approach of, okay, and this is also something that I work with my clients on because all of my clients are not women of color. Um, and, but just still helping whoever it is understand we can focus on the things that we can control, right? So if we're not going to get our fair slice of the pie from the government or whoever, what things can I do to kind of bring back the power within myself and then extend that power to my family? Like I said, teaching my clients, hey, talk to your children about this. 
this is maybe how you can reframe what we're talking about to maybe a, a childlike level so that they can understand and grasp what we're talking about um, and passing that information down. Because when I got into fixing my own finances, I realized, you know, this is crazy that it's not, when you look at the, a lot of the technical pieces of it, it's not hard right? A lot of it is the mindset thing and overcoming fear and not feeling like if, if I don't have my money on me at all times, you know, I need to be able to see and feel and touch my money and I need to spend it because I can't take it with me when I die anyway. And, you know, overcoming like those things within yourself, that's what's really going to make the difference. So yes, I love, absolutely love that I'm able to impart that stuff, those kind of things into women of color, because those are the things that, you know, no matter what's happening around us, it's still, I know within myself, I have a certain power to do something better for myself and my family and keep that going. And you're taking that information and just like your Instagram handle, you're educating them about mm -hmm. finances and what they can do. And then they can pass that down right, to their kids and then the grandkids. And then it kind of stops there. I think that it's so often too, like the, the deck is stacked against certain communities. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it comes down to, you know, yeah, like people within the community and others who support those, those communities to, to speak out. And it's almost like, you know, like the passing on an oral history, but like an oral finance lesson, you know, of like, mm -hmm. Hey, this is the right stuff to do so that you can be successful. Even when the deck is stacked against you, or even when the government is going to continue, like you said, like if they, if they wanted to, if they truly cared and wanted to, like, it's all platitudes at this point. It's, it's mm -hmm. all just saying stuff with, with no, you know, plan or no true idea behind it. It's just spewing stuff to get elected or whatever. And then, I mean, mm -hmm. it all changes 38 days later, <laughs> but I mean, it, I, it, yeah, it's just, it's frustrating because it's, you know, as, as we're both teachers and, as we slowly learn more and understand a little bit more of what the world is like outside of our little bubble, it's mm -hmm. like, okay, wait a minute, this doesn't sit right. This doesn't feel good. And people could make people in power could make a difference and could make a different choice if they wanted to, but it's clear that that's probably not going to happen. So mm -hmm. it, you're right. I think it does come down to like the communities being like, okay, whew, we got to find out what we're going to do to, to help out and to, you know, pass it on to the next generations. So that's really, right. I mean, it's just really cool that you do that. And you're the first black woman that we've gotten to interview. And it's important for us to listen to black voices and to have black voices on our podcast and to be supporting black voices in the financial space. So, so thank you for that. Thank you guys. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. You're awesome. No problem. You're doing good work. Thank you. You guys are too with, the, I mean, you're just this podcast alone, you know, and I was listening about like the, the HSAs and, and all the things I was just like, this is good valuable information right that you're passing out and it's not, it's not like your podcast is just for people that aren't of color right anybody can pull up your podcast and listen to it so you all are still doing your part to educate the masses on your own that's our hope thank you thank you yeah, yeah we we focus towards millennials but we also have our grandmas listening so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of cool yeah okay so for us when we first really got into the financial I mean, our whole journey started listening to the Dave Ramsey show, which um, if you haven't listened to a, an episode, we are no longer following him. Yeah. But anyway, so we were like hardcore Dave Ramsey listeners. And then every person we talked to, we were like, hey, we have money advice for you. We got to tell you everything <laughs> we just learned. And um, that got really annoying real fast. <laughs> mm -hmm. So as a financial coach, do you ever find – that you are, I don't know if it would be like financial advice, but that you are just talking money with people all the time, like with your friends and your family, or do you feel like you have a pretty good boundary line between like, okay, these are my clients. I will talk to these people about money. And then these are my friends and family who didn't really ask for it. So I'm not going to talk to them. How do you handle that? I have a very hard line. I do not talk about people with money that do not want to talk about money. Um, the people in my personal life or my friends, family, they know what I do. They may not know to what depth because like my, like my mom, my parents, don't, they're not on Instagram and like, you know, everybody's, <laughs> all the family stuff happens on Facebook. <clears throat> and so I don't, I don't promote anything on Facebook at all. So 
it's a there's a a, a separation. Um, and then even when I'm around my family, because you know people people say things and people notice your money. That's how they notice your money, you know, and they, the way they, what they perceive to be your money, you know, if you have a certain, a certain car or, you know, oh, because I have a coach bag, you know, like, oh, and it's got money or something like that. So, you know, sometimes like when, when certain money things come up, you know, I may, I may say, it, it just kind of, it really depends, but it, it, it's mostly no. So, and sometimes they'll come to me like, oh yeah, I talked to my friend, we gonna get into these stocks because I'm trying to, and I'm looking at you like, and I, I have to proceed within myself if, you're, if you if you really want to have a real conversation about money or if you just want to talk about what's trendy, right? And so if you want to talk about what's trendy, <laughs> yeah, like we can do that and keep it very surface level. Um, but I typically don't talk about money unless they bring it up to me. I think my mom said, she mentioned something to me about, stocks and how to get started and I was just like oh great like here's what you can do and then I kind of back off and see if that person is serious are they going to step up and actually do these things or even read about these things um and then we can further the conversation but I absolutely have a hard line <laughs> that um and it's just very easy for me to keep that distinction I think also because I'm a very I don't know like I guess I would say maybe I'm more of a private person Right. So like even on Instagram, like I don't share a ton about my personal life. Um, so it's kind of like it, it even like in, even away from from Instagram, I'm used to having kind of a, a filter on like when to say things and when not to say things. So it's just kind of easy for right. me to separate. That's been <laughs> it's been really hard for us, but I feel like we've been getting better. We definitely don't solicit unwanted money advice <laughs> um, as much as we used to. But it, re- it makes me think about swimming lessons. I've been teaching swimming lessons since 2007 for a very, very mm-hmm. long time. And I wouldn't just walk up to someone at the pool, a friend of mine or whatever, and just be like, hey, you're doing this wrong. This is what you need to do. You need to have your kid wearing this swimsuit, this life jacket, blah, blah, blah. Like I wouldn't just do that because they didn't ask me. But if they came to me and they were like, hey, I have a question. How do I do this? I, I will – open the floodgates and tell them I was telling Justin today someone asked me about a life jacket and it brightened (laughs) up my whole day like I'm so excited that someone asked me about a life jacket they actually wanted my advice on the life jacket so that's different than just telling people (laughs) who really don't don't care about all the things I have to say that they're doing wrong with teaching their kids how to swim (laughs) you know like I, I really have to just control myself and be like okay people don't want money advice unless they specifically asked for it and that has been yeah it's been hard yeah Yeah. what about for you has it been easier i I don't know with this platform we've really cooled down yeah for sure i don't know if it's been easier but i think you're right candace in that people you have to like ask people straight up like yo like do you want to vent or talk about whatever's going on in your world or are you asking me for advice Mm -hmm. like i love you either way we're tight either way whatever our relationship is but we have to understand, like, what are you looking for here? I'll listen if you just want somebody to listen. But if you want me to give you my advice, I'm going to be real with you. I'm going to tell you maybe mm-hmm. something you don't want to hear right. or maybe something you're right that's not trendy. Like, hey, don't get GameStop. Just invest in some index funds and sit <laughs> on it instead. Like, you know, sometimes yeah. people don't want to hear that. They want to hop on the trends. So I think it's good that you have those, like, firm lines of, like, you know, I'll give you advice when you're actually asking for advice or I'll just sit and listen if that's what you want. But it can get yeah. easy to push the boundary. Yeah. I love that you guys have your your outlet though, because sometimes, like if you've been teaching swimming since like 2007, you said, it's like it makes you excited, but you're past that initial phase of like zeal, right? So That's if you're very just, true. <laughs> yeah. So if you so if you're like in the finance phase and you're like, oh my gosh, like this is still like brand new, so I'm like on fire about right. this, then it's a little bit different. Um, where you're just, you feel more, you know, you just feel that fire more to share it. Yeah. That's That's, a good way to put it. That's a really good point because I, I get like fired up about (laughs) money conversations Mm. and yeah, when people talk about uh, like preventing drownings and all of that, yes, that makes me very excited to talk about that, but it's not like at the forefront of my mind as it used to be. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Mm-hmm. I don't know. They, she'll see some pictures on Facebook sometimes and like at least send me it and be like, 
this is not safe. Like, well, <laughs> I, I will definitely reshare things on on my own personal Facebook and tell the world that that this is what I recommend, but I'm not going to, you know, comment on people's pictures and say that those floaties are very unsafe. Anyway, going right. on a tangent here. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay, Candice, our famous last question, and I'm excited to, to ask another financial coach this. Yes. We our, our, our question is, if you could put a stop sign on anybody's financial journey, where would you put that stop sign? What would you stop them from doing? What do you think is – I mean, like the biggest thing you would not want them to do. Yeah. Um, this is a good question. Um, I would say maybe put the stop sign on someone who either like just graduated from college or they just got their first like quote unquote real job, um, with benefits and all that. Do not feel ashamed to stay home. Right. And this mm. is assuming that your home space is is safe. It's a comfortable environment. There's no abuse going on or anything like that. Stay home. OK, go. And when you stay home, don't be like me. Right. Make sure that you're actually taking care of your money. You're learning about, you know, money things and taking full advantage of what your job has to offer and all that stuff. Because I think when people branch out on their own, it leads to bad decision after bad decision after bad decision because you're on your own like you you guys talked about having the credit card as the emergency fund and when you're out on your own without maybe the help of a supportive family it's it's easier to fall into that spiral like you mentioned by having to maintain everything on your own because if you you know if you really don't know kind of what it takes to be on your own and not just working but you're working now you have to keep up your own house you got to clean up everything you got to cook and always have your own food and oh god don't have a, a, a pet or children like you're you're really stretched <laughs> right um and so when you're at home you just have a bit more time to reflect you can kind of it's just a blessing um just the, the different ways that it can help you to stay at home if you absolutely have that option um and it's a healthy option to have so yeah, that's what that's what I would say. Just pump the brakes. I know we want our own space. We want to have our boo come over. We want to Netflix and chill <laughs> and do all the things. But, um, you know, it's like one of those things you in the moment, you might be like, oh, my God, I don't want to do it. But then two years later, you look back and you're like, oh, my God, I'm so glad I did that. Yeah, I like that, especially like two years, if you think even just two years of staying at home a little bit longer while you're in a really solid career with benefits and stuff. I mean, you can make some serious traction in your financial landscape. Oh, for sure. And if you're graduating college and you have student loans like most of us do, you can really put a fat dent in that if that's what you choose to do. Like yeah. you can hammer that out. Yeah, that's very good advice. That's great I think advice. you're the yeah, only one that, that has said that. And, oh, you yes. know, sometimes people when they're living at home, they're still paying rent, but it's significantly less than they would be if they went and got a one bedroom apartment by themselves. Yeah, for sure. What yeah. did you pay? You lived at home for a while. Was yeah. it like 500 bucks? Yeah, it was like 500 or 600 bucks. It wasn't that much. I stayed, but I didn't have a career yet, but I stayed throughout college. I stayed at home and my mom was just like, Hey, throw in a little bit to help with bills. But that was, it, it was like 500 or 600 bucks. And it really helped. It definitely helped. There's no way I would have made it work going to school full time and trying to work and stuff on my own yeah. like it would have been really stressful and then we moved from yeah. there to like 2300 yeah. a month so that, that was, was a jump <laughs> that was really uh, stupid yeah that's so that's definitely a jump i actually did that in this i was an adult right like i was when i when i had that mortgage denial and i was like i don't know what i'm gonna do like i don't want to renew my lease and i went I didn't go back home because I'm a, I moved away from home. I'm in, you know, I mentioned I'm in Atlanta. All my family's in DC, but I did have someone who was gracious enough to let me stay in their living room, right, rent free for 12 months. Oh, and, that's awesome. And I would, and like you said, you know, there's so much. And even if your even if your situation isn't quite this sweet, right? Even if you have to rent a room or whatever you have to do to cut your expenses down and be laser focused on what you want and being clear on, we always talk about being clear on that why. And when you will stay rooted in that, you can make so much progress and put yourself years ahead through in 11 or 12 months or two years or whatever. So it's really, you know, depending on what your lifestyle is like, you know, even if you're not just graduating from college, but if you just realize I need to make some kind of change and just cutting, temporarily changing your lifestyle, right? 
for the long term benefit um, is definitely, you know, you, you pay yourself back triple time. Oh, for sure. Okay, I have to ask, do you think you'll ever move back to DC? Because DC is a pretty pricey area, I think, kind of like California, like it's pretty expensive out there. And I don't know what Atlanta is, or like if you're in, in a, an expensive part of Atlanta or not, but I can't imagine it's close to DC's cost. No, I I thought I wanted to move back <laughs> last year, and then I was in the process of doing that actually. Um, and I never really even I never announced that, but I had like gotten a job back home and everything, and then coronavirus happened, and so I didn't go. And I was like, oh my god, like you saved me from myself because I would have gone from paying, you know, because I have a mortgage, but my mortgage is like significantly less than anything I've ever paid. To going back home and even if I went back home to my parents or whatever, at some point, like I would have had to move out and, you know, it's just not, I would have been, and then the, with the, you know, with me being with the government, you know, they have locality pay, you know, they change your, you know, change your pay kind of based on where you live. And so even though DC is a higher cost of living area, that salary, that COLA cost of living adjustment is not enough for me in my opinion, to match, um, you know, the, the higher cost of living there. So it would have been, it, it's just stressful. <laughs> it's just stressful uh, the further north you go. So no, that, so anyway, I'm talking in circles. No, I do not want to move back. I <laughs> thought I did and I learned my lesson and I'm going to stay down south for as far as I can see. <laughs> I like it. Nice. So Candice, thank you so much for coming to chat with us. I wanted to ask you, where can people find you? All of the people listening, all three of them are going to be <laughs> so fired up and they probably will want to reach out and chat with you because you are awesome. So what's your Instagram handle? If you have a website, you can give us that information as well. Yes. So my Instagram handle is millennial financial educator. Say that five times fast. Um, <laughs> and then I'm also on Twitter and clubhouse as millennial Fin Ed, so it's kind of like millennial find, F F I N E D, because you know you gotta shorten the handles and all that stuff. Um, and my website is just my name, CandiceMcGee.com, but I'm most active on Instagram. You know, so millennial financial educator is the way to find me. Um, and what was I gonna say? You guys, also, like, I wanna just toss this in there. I know I don't know if you guys hit your goal of downloads, but when I heard you talking about it on one of the episodes I was listening to, I was like, I'm gonna be one of those people that helps to meet whatever the however many thousand downloads you were trying to get because I was listening to all these episodes and I was like, this is, <laughs> the, the, the ticker is going up, it's going up. So I hope you guys hit your goal, but I definitely we was did. Doing my part. Ah! Thank you. So <laughs> yeah, I was, I was doing my part. We love it. Right before we hopped on, Haley was checking the audio generator that we use, and we were at 12,012 downloads. So what? Yeah, that's what it, it said, 12,012. No, it didn't. It was 12,100 and something. Okay, so it, we're looked over like 100 1, 000, over. it looked like 12,012 to me. So even better, <laughs> you certainly helped us hit it. Let's look right yes, now. I'm so glad. Look, I so, I swear. Okay, I saw, no, see, you okay, looked at it wrong. Sorry, 12,102. Yeah. I missed the middle oh. zero. Well, place value, Mr. Brown. It's place right. value. My fifth graders are going to get on me. <laughs> Crazy. Do you think they listen? Uh, I hope not. Uh, do they do? Okay, for real, because I've Googled me, and I've yeah. Googled you, and our podcast shows up, so they may listen. Uh, there's one kid who's pretty tech savvy, so he might. <laughs> That's scary. <laughs> Uh -oh. Teach them easy. Teach, teach them young. Yeah, we're in trouble. Yeah. Anyways, Candice, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. We appreciate you chatting with us, and we're excited for your continued growth as a, a financial coach. We're both hyped to see where it's at in the next few years and if you go into full-time coaching. <laughs> thank you. We appreciate you. Take care. You're totally you going to do it. That's going to do it for this episode of The Price of Avocado Toast. As always, we are so thankful to have had this conversation with you today, and we're so thankful to be a part of this community. Make sure you're listening to hear more about our house updates. As always, happy budgeting. You've got this, Toasties. Thank you for listening to The Price of Avocado Toast. If you vibed with this episode, share it with a friend. If you're interested in speaking more of the financial coach, hit up our coach Ryan at me financially free on Instagram.